now I would like to introduce our, our keynote speaker, um, Hetty Chang. Um, Hetty is the Executive Director of Attendance Works, and she began her work um, researching chronic absenteeism back in 2010 with, when very few, if any, schools were really tracking um, those types of data and chronic absenteeism. And Attendance Works itself provides a wealth of information for schools and districts to really address the issue of chronic absenteeism with lots of toolkits, um, resources, messaging for parents. Um, so a lot of good information out there through their research. Um, in February of 2013, Hetty was named Champion of Change by the White House. And just um, this past month in September, um, their most recent research was released um, titled Portraits of Change, Aligning School and Community Resources to Reduce Chronic Absences. So without further ado, um, I wel please welcome Hetty Chang. Good morning. Okay, is this, hmm, good? Okay. Um, so it is such a pleasure to be here. Um, let me just say a couple things. You know, actually, um, so I, we launched Attendance Works in 2010. But in 2006 is when I started doing um, the research to start Attendance Works. I didn't know I was starting Attendance Works then. I had been asked by the Annie Casey Foundation to look at whether or not kids missing too much school in kindergarten and first was a reason they weren't reading by the end of third grade. And Ralph Smith, who was the then um, senior vice president, asked me to do three things. He said, figure out what's the prevalence and scale of chronic absence, figure out what its impact on academics is, and look for promise promising interventions that might actually affect attendance. And that's how I got in touch with Check and Connect and Sandy Christensen. And that was probably in about 2007. Sandy and I were trying to remember. We probably have to look for some old email where I uh, talked to her. And Sandy is right here, for those of you who haven't met her. Um, she's um, been such a fabulous innovator on this work. And all of the people involved in Check and Connect. Um, we're, I'm going to talk today a little bit about how Check and Connect um, fits with our overall framework. What I've always been struck by is how there is so much synergy between um, what Check and Check Connect tries to do and how we think about it. But I think we come at the issue in slightly different ways. Um, you're almost adding up from individual kids, and we're looking at patterns of data to try to get to shift a system of which the intervention of Check and Connect is one piece of that system. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, before I start, I want to ask just a couple questions because I realize I'm not sure I know who all is in the room. How many of you all work at a school site level? All right, quite a few. How many at the district level? State level? Few? How many people are working federally, nationally? Couple. And how many of you are um, in school, you work actually you're within the school district or st department of ed or somewhere in schools. How many of you are from community partners that partner with schools? Okay, one last set of questions and I'll leave you alone. How many of you are working elementary level? Middle schools? High schools? All right. Um, okay, actually I lied. I did have one last set of questions. How many of you guys are on the East Coast? Midwest? And we're in Minnesota, of course. More, larger on the Midwest. South? How about West Coast? I will admit that today's been a tough day starting up. I, I live in San Francisco. I have staff. It's, it's actually pretty challenging times to keep moving forward when you have sort of really, really catastrophic, catastrophic events. I don't know if you all have been seeing the fires, but um, you cannot fly out of the Bay Area without flying through a haze of smoke. Um, it's just horrifying, and almost everyone you know is affected um, in some way because we're not that big of a community. But that said, um, 
I think one of the things I find power in our work is even when there's crazy things happening in the world, there are things we can do for kids, and there are things we can do to make life a better place. Um, and reducing chronic absence is actually one of those very concrete opportunities. Um, just a couple things. How many of you have actually been onto the Attendance Works website? Yay, and hopefully by the end of this, all of you will have raised your hand. Um, a couple key things just to know about Attendance Works. We are a tiny little nonprofit initiative. Um, so um, sometimes I feel like it's the Wizard of Oz. If you actually open the little curtain, you'd be surprised there's like five of us sitting there. Um, <laughs> um, but we have a website that has a quarter million people on it. Um, every year, um, so you know you can't tell how many people sit behind a website. <laughs> um, we actually are a virtual organization because no one ever wants to come to us. They only want us to come to them. Um, and the key is we're a giveaway strategy. If you'll notice, our website has tons of free materials. We are a nonprofit. My associate director always says we're, we're your favorite four-letter word, F-R-E-E. -E. Um, but in any case. This is sounding a little loud. Um, the key to our work is what I know is you can't do cookie cutter approaches to getting kids to school, right? You have to know kids, you have to build relationships, that's what Check and Connect is built on. You have to know the language, you have to know the context. At the same time, there is a core of what happens to getting kids to school that is not that different. You have to tailor it. You can't you know, take it off the shelf. You have to make it meaningful. If you start from scratch to invent everything that you're ever gonna do to try to get kids to school, you'll be so tired by the time you get to tailoring it that you won't actually be able to implement with the kind of care that you need. But I guarantee you that maybe 80%, 70, 80% of what you've tried, someone else in this country tried before you. And now, sometimes it didn't work, and you actually want to know why it didn't work and how you don't want to replicate that, or sometimes it worked really well, and you want to build off that. So what our goal is through our website, through our webinars, through our resources, is making sure no one has to reinvent the wheel. We don't have sufficient resources. We're not investing in our public education systems in the way that we need to, and that means we better be as effective as we possibly can with what we have so it makes a difference for kids and families. So I encourage you to use our website um, and, and make sure that, and, and most stuff is aimed so that you can take and tailor it and own it yourself. Um, I've always said we don't have a very big staff, but we got a lot of allies who use our materials. So this term chronic absence, how many of you all have ever looked at chronic absence in your own schools? Few. The thing about chronic absence is that um, really until this year, no one was looking at this term, and no one actually even knew what it was. Uh, I mean, few people, but it was in small places. And part of it is that um, when we start, when I started this work in 2006, and I asked people, "Do you track attendance?" Everyone said, "Yes, of course we track attendance." But this is one of those places where truly God is in the details of how you define and track something. So typically, we look at average daily attendance, right? And toggle between slides. Average daily attendance, which is how many kids show up every day to school. And the truth is, and I was thinking about this as um, Check and Connect was talking about its fabulous new app that it's introducing. Technological change is changing the way we engage in education. When I started this work in 2006, 2007, very few districts actually had electronic databases. We took attendance by paper and pencil. It was sort of the most people could do to say how many kids showed up to my school. If you have everyone's paper and pencil thing, you cannot add up how many kids miss so much school for any reason because you're not going to sort through single pieces of paper. You know, you could say 100 kids out of my 120 kids showed up. That was about the most you could do. Truancy, which really varies. We also are, at, one of the things I've learned from this work is that we believe in democracy really strongly in this country. And we believe that everyone, particularly in education, I actually think, seriously, we 
created the founding of this country a lot out of freedom from persecution and religion and the freedom to raise our kids the way we wanted to. If you like go back to what the people who created our Constitution. So there's a really strong belief that local control over education is really important. The challenge is it means that we get to define everything locally. And when you try to do something nationally, it's really hard to compare anything. So truancy, which typically only refers to unexcused absences, looks different in every single state, almost. California and Minnesota actually have the same sort of definition of truancy, which is, I think, Minnesota does, three times late any time or three times late to class by 30 minutes. By the way, those of you in Minnesota, do you know why you have the same definition? Because the woman who created our definition moved to Minnesota. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, how did Minnesota end up? And I ended up talking to Maribel Gonzalez, who lives here in Minnesota now. And that's how you ended up with basically the same definition of truancy. In Maryland, the definition of truancy is missing 20% of the school year due to unexcused absences. Three unexcused, three times late to 30 minutes compared to 36 absences in a year. And people would say, how come the truancy rates in California look so much worse than the truancy rates in Maryland? Because they ain't the same thing. Truancy helps you to define when are you going to use, le it's a connect connected to our compulsory ed laws. I actually think it's connected to when we used to have child labor laws and you were trying to make sure people sent their kids to school. So it's actually, um, it's about when should you use the courts to be able to compel families to abide by the, the compulsory ed laws. And it does tell you, particularly at middle and older kids where it tends to get bigger, when kids are missing school and no adult around knows that that's happening. And that's actually an important thing to know. These tell you really different things. Average daily attendance tells you how many kids, and, and one of the things, things about data, the dangers of data is we get overwhelmed by it. We'll have better and better data, more and more data accessible, and we will have not a clue how to use it. Unless we can answer, think about what question is this trying to ask and answer. Average daily attendance tells you how many kids show up to school every day. So it tells you things like, wow, the day after Halloween, that's a problem. Or the day after school, the snow day is actually almost worse than the day that the kids are gone for the snow day because kids still can't get to school and now the teachers are dealing with turn. Or, huh, when we do half day professional development days, no kids showed up to school. Or what does it mean when the days that we have short days for parent teacher conferences, none of the kids show up to school? You can look at those days, you can see patterns and you can address overarching things that affect kids' attendance. Truancy tells you again when you might need to le use legal authority to enforce something. The key is it should be the very last resort, not your first resort. There are a few places for families for whom it might be effective, but if we try to, it does not work as a first place, both because it makes families mad, and second, um, it's really expensive. Lawyers are expensive. And so we can't do it in the effective ways that sometimes you can use with legal intervention. Chronic absence is who's missing school, so much school that they're academically at risk. And just a couple things about that. Um, so it includes, in my view, excused, unexcused, and suspensions. I don't care why a kid is missing school. If they are missing out on instruction, it means they can't benefit from it, right? If we think instruction matters in any way, then missing out on instruction is a problem. I actually think this may get worse because one of the things that's wonderful about Common Core and even those states who've not adopted Common Core but are trying to revamp their curriculum is it's a much more active learning process, right? Because we know that kids learn better when they're active and they're applying that. But do you know what? That kind of active learning is hard to replicate at home. If kids aren't in the classroom, they can't get the concepts. I don't know how many of you have kids who, um, I have a ninth, a 10th grader. He was at the far edge of when we got rid of algebra and it's part of Common Core. I have no idea how he's learning math. I don't know how to, to you know, make up for time lost in tests. So if we think anything is 
instructor dependent, they gotta be in class to learn. And we have now a ton of research that actually, well, let me, before I do that. So here's um, truancy, just some examples of why it's important to know the difference. This is my own school district. Um, when I first got them to crunch their numbers. Look at the red line. That's the number of kids who missed 10% or more at that point of school. The black line is the kids who missed 10 unexcused absence. It would have been so serious that they would have actually started to have a school attendance review team. What do you notice about those lines? Those lines? Just turn to the person next to you. What do you see? What do you notice about the data? Okay, I'm jumping down for a second. All right, anyone willing to share? What do you see about the data? Okay, someone, this table, what'd you notice? The, the, the older the students get, the closer they get. So truancy is a little more accurate on unexcused among older kids than the younger kids. That younger split, right? Look at the kids who are chronically absent in kindergarten. If you use truancy, you would have missed half the kids who are academically at risk, right? That's because kindergartners don't go sit there at five years old and say, hey, I think I'll skip school and not tell mom. That's like not how young kids miss school. There are health issues. There are parent challenges. There are transportation challenges. There is concern, you know, but by and large, families more n know that their kids are home. So I also want to just share one thing. This is true. So in every California district that I've known, our chronic absence levels get better in middle school when you look at our official data. Couple things to know. California is funded based on average daily attendance. We're one of seven states. State law says as long as a child shows up one period, they get counted as there. What happens in middle school? We shift to period attendance, right? Usually chronic absence gets worse in transition years. It doesn't look like it's getting worse in our transition year, but I'm not convinced that the data's right. And in fact, my school district re-ran its data. It's significantly worse if you use period attendance and you miss 10% of any periods instead of using what we report to the state. Now, it's not because my state, my district's trying to, you know, falsify information. They're just trying to make sure they have resources. But the problem is what we're pa paying for, what we're collecting for average daily attendance creates a disincentive for being an effective early warning system, right? Because an early warning system is based on the fact that you have valid data identifying kids as early as possible. Which, and so one of the things to always use for data, and one of the things I think that is gonna happen is more data on chronic absence is gonna be available than ever before, is you should look at the data and ask the question, does this seem right? And if it doesn't, you have to ask whether we've got data accuracy issues. Because if we wanna use data to target intervention, it's only as helpful to us as it's accurate. This is looking at average daily attendance, and this is the other thing that I hear all the time. We have good average daily attendance. Why should we be worried about our chronic absence? And in this case, what I know is you can have 95% average daily attendance and still have as much as even 20% of your kids chronically absent. If you have a school of 200 kids, right? 10 kids don't show up. You have 95% average daily attendance. It's not the same 10 kids who don't show up day in and day out every single of your 180 days of a school year, right? If it was the same kids and they never ever showed up, the likelihood that they would still be enrolled by the end of the year is kind of slim. 180 days, 10 empty seats every day, that's 1,800 absences, right? Let's say you had 50 kids, each who missed 20 days over the course of a year. That's 1,000 absences. You still have 800 absences left to spread among all the other kids. That's a 25% chronic absence problem. People keep thinking they don't have a 
chronic absence problem because they have high average daily attendance and high average daily attendance does not tell you what, whether or not you do or don't. By the time you have chronic absence levels at 20, 25%, the churn that's happening in your school now means that the level of churn is actually affecting the educational experience of all kids. So it's not just a kid who's chronically absent whose academic experience is being affected, but now you've got teachers who are trying to figure out whose educational need am I going to meet? And we've got pretty good classrooms in this country. There is actually research by a guy named Michael Gottfried who showed that um, chronic absence affects um, their peers, and some peers are affected more. Interesting, kids on, with special ed, on special ed were affected more. K girls were affected more. Low-income kids are affected more. I think these are kids who get affected. You know, there's some kids, you sit them in a corner, you can have total chaos, and they just keep going. There's other kids. I have these theories about why girls might be more attuned to their socialization in the classroom, who their experience gets affected more. And then the last thing I would just say is we often don't notice chronic absence because it doesn't happen consecutively. It's sporadic. And particularly families with, you know, facing hardships or teachers with large classrooms. They don't see the sporadic absences. This is really a shift in this country also from truancy. We've had a heavy dose of truancy laws, which has really focused legal compliance. It's really been an, truancy is an after the fact. Then I'll take you to court. Chronic absence is trying to go to prevention, say, where are their kids at risk because there's been chronic absence? And then how do I prevent them from missing so much in the classroom that they now need academic remediation? So can I get three people, three volunteers? I promise it won't hurt. Please. I just need one more. All right, so we have Karen, yay for name tags, Patty and Matt. Okay, a oh, Karen. Okay, Karen, why don't you sit here, Karen, or stand here, and then Patty, stand here, and then Matt, and you're gonna face me. Okay, so Karen, Patty, and Matt are all five years old, and this is their first day of kindergarten. Woo! <laughs> but Matt here, his family, they lived in this public housing complex, kind of isolated well, um, from resources, schools. So you know what, Matt, your family didn't even know about the great full day pre-K program that existed probably maybe half a mile away. Um, and so you didn't go to anything before kindergarten at all. No early learning experience. Can you take eight steps back to represent eight, nine step um, months of learning that you would have gotten had you gone? Now Patty, her family lived not too far, but they were, you just were a little more connected, knew about that preschool program, went to that preschool program, but then about three months in, dad lost his job, car broke down, you started not showing up. The preschool program, which was, had a long waiting list, kind of said, oh, maybe this isn't a good fit for you. So you were kind of counseled out of preschool because you weren't showing up so regularly. Can you take four steps back because you only got half the benefit? Karen here though, she went, she's great, she's in kindergarten, but you know, you guys are in this public schools that they've been investing in high quality kindergarten teaching. So you all got a great, incredible kindergarten teacher. Karen, can you take eight steps forward, representing eight, nine months of learning, and you guys get to the same size step, same size as Karen, because you got equally good kindergarten teaching. Wow, you took bigger steps. <laughs> well, some kids expand faster, you know. <laughs> you were really trying hard when you were in class. <laughs> you spent extra time with that teacher. Um, that can't happen, by the way. <laughs> That's okay. I'm just teasing. 
I one time did this with kids, and there was one kid, he was not going to be left out. <laughs> he was like, I'm going to take really big steps. Um, but there's some truth to that. Anyway, so they, you guys got into kindergarten, but you know what happened, Matt? So what happened is, and one of the reasons your parents didn't send you to preschool was actually the places that you were living was, it was kind of um, the, 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 there was mold. Your parents were actually a little worried that you had, might have asthma. Um, they not, and by the way, have you guys ever seen kids though who the first time they're, they're in kindergarten, it's the first time that child has ever been with a non-family member? It's the Klingon kids, right? They scream a lot. The poor, everyone's upset. The parent feels guilty that they just put their kid who's screaming. It's a hard transition. If kindergarten's the very first time and these are big classes, it's a hard transition. So you were having one of those hard transitions, but you also noticed that if I said, if you said, Mommy, I kind of have a stomachache, Mom was like, Oh, I think Matt, you should just stay home with me. Or if you went, <coughs> That got you home too. Um, and you kind of didn't like school so much, so you know, you were you were happy to stay home. How much was real is a little unclear. Um, so you actually ended up missing out two whole days, two about four days, sorry. At least uh, you were what we call severely chronically absent. So you missed uh, about two months out of the entire school year. Uh, not all days in a row but it's about four days a month. And the problem is it wasn't just the days that you missed, it's the day when you come back and you still didn't know what was going on in the classroom. So can you take um, uh, two steps back for the two months you actually missed, another two steps back for the days that you came back and didn't know what was going on? Judy here, the Patty, sorry. Um, Patty here, um, she, you, you went to school, but those car issues, those challenges, they were still affecting what was going on. So by the time you got into, um, so you actually missed about a month. So can you take one step back and then one step again for the day when you came back? But Karin here, she's doing great, she's excited. And by the time the summer comes, Karin sees this program at the library. It's all about reading and you know just keeping up in the summer, and you're like, I want to be in that. So you sign up for that great liter summer literacy program. By the time you get into first grade, you're a month ahead. Can you take a step forward? But Matt here, who's running out of space, um, <laughs> I think we'll just turn you this way. He sees that same program and thinks, I'm having none of it because. I'm, I'm already feeling kind of behind. I'm embarrassed. I don't really like this stuff. And you know, your family's pretty poor, so they don't have any literacy materials in the home. So can you take another two steps back? Because you actually end up two more steps behind, um, more months behind in reading, which is a common level of summer reading loss. <sighs> Patty here lost about, oh, a month, not so bad, because she was still looking at some stuff at home a little bit here and there. All right, if you don't intervene, who's reading by the end of third grade? Not so sure about Patty. We might get extra help and we speed up. And for sure, poor Matt here is in pretty dire straits, right? By the time you get to middle and high school, he's years behind. Thank you so much. Big hand for our volunteers. That, by the way, is called Illustrating the Gap. Um, we even, if you go on our website and look under Tools and TA for, and look at resources for parents, we actually have a um, detailed explanation of how you can run that. It can, you can do it in about four minutes. You can do it as part of any parent-teacher parent teacher, um, uh, gathering, if you want, um, to kind of talk about what that means. This is actually, um, for those of you who are more academic and prefer charts to um, uh, interactive exercises, um, this is the academic data geek version of that um, <laughs> pattern. So this is actually from Chicago Public Schools. The bar on the far left with, that's green are the kids. These are all low-income kids. They were in their subsidized programs. Um, and Head Start programs. The kids on the left were the kids who were not chronically absent ever. The kids who on the right were the kids who were chronically absent in pre-K, K, first and second. 
and they needed intensive intervention on their Dibble scores by the end of second grade. Um, what they found in the Chicago Public Schools, there's great work done by a woman named Stacy Ehrlich, and this is the University of Chicago, Chicago um, Consortium on School Research. Um, what they found was, interestingly enough, the kids, the impact on attendance was greatest for the kids who came in least ready. So one of the reasons you come in least ready to school is because your parents have the least resources to kind of help you develop the literacy skills at home, right? So the kids who showed up more gained more. The kids who showed up less lost more. Make sense? And on every dimension, whether it was social emotional learning, math, or numeracy, reading pre-literacy skills. What they found in um, Rhode Island, where they actually have longitudinal data. By the way, I don't think anyone in Minnesota, because we're here, I, mean, I don't think Minnesota's ever looked at chronic absence statewide. Maybe it has changed for ESSA. You have the data here. There are many, most states, with the exception of mine, um, <laughs> California, um, I think actually almost everyone has already changed this, and Maine, they're both, we're both in the early stages of collecting attendance data. Most states have attendance data in their longitudinal student data systems and could calculate this, they just may or may not have done it. Um, but in uh, Rhode Island, which was an early adopter of looking at this, they found that when they could take a cohort of kids, chronic absence in kindergarten predicted lower literacy in first grade and worse outcomes, and it grew over time by fifth grade. One of the things that happens is if you have a kid who's chronically absent in can one, do you remember that slide from San Francisco? Third grade is typically a time when kids' attendance improves. I think kids are less dependent on their families, they get sick less, you know, there's a whole set of things. But if you missed a lot of school in kindergarten and first, you can show up in third and still fall behind, right? Because if you're not reading, you can still be in the classroom and not know what's going on. So by fifth grade, the kids who were chronically absent in kindergarten, that predicted higher suspension rates by the end of seventh grade. So you have this pattern that started really early. Now you're not reading by third grade. Now in fourth or fifth or sixth grade, you're not going to show other kids that you don't know what's going on. You're going to probably misbehave or because you're not engaged. The challenge is we didn't notice early enough. Now, there are kids who they lose it in the, the transition grades are hard grades. So there are some kids who did okay in elementary school and sixth grade, the data shows. And that's, this is one of those things that I think Checking Connect's been so great about. There's different data points. You know that, so this is an early and often. It's not that just because you showed up in kindergarten guarantees that you're gonna you know, be good all the way through high school. But any time you start to miss out, you need to intervene early. And if you don't intervene as the first sign of this, there are really potential challenges. And I will say it's true that chronic absence has a greater impact on literacy in the young kids among kids who are low income. Middle and upper class families sometimes have patterns of absenteeism, and they find ways to make up for it in literacy. By the time kids get older, maybe because we parents don't really know how to teach numeracy, you actually have to show up to school. You have to show up to school to pass algebra. You have to sc show up to school to pass geometry. That, you know, those things, I mean, families still might be able to find tutors to help make you up, so the impact is still a little differential. But really, by the time, um, the impact on the sciences and math starts to in increase and starts to be cross-class. Um, whereas literacy is a little more concentrated in the lower grades among um, lower income kids. This is data in, uh, and this is actually across all backgrounds um, from Utah. They found that if you looked at eighth through ninth grade, any year of chronic absence was associated with a third of the kids, more than a third of the kids dropping out. Any two years of chronic absence was associated with half of the kids dropping out if you missed class between eighth and ninth and eighth and twelfth grade. So the consequences of being chronically absent, which leads to course failure, which leads to being off track for high school graduation, is very serious by middle and high school. Okay, so the good news is we actually know a lot now about how to address this issue. 
And we are in a watershed moment for advancing this work because chronic absence, which was not ever understood as a metric, was included in ESSA. And I will say that I think it was included because, as I mentioned, Attendance Works has a lot of champions in a lot of places. And we actually were uh, connected with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, which was a national campaign. We had little, we had um, districts and states across the country before ESSA got passed having adopted and working on chronic absence, and we had what we call bright spots, places that had been able to make a difference and turn around chronic absence. Um, we actually don't lobby. In, 2000, in fall of 2015, when ESSA was being um, debated in Congress and was now in the Health Committee, um, in the Senate Committee, um, we had friends who got it into the legislation, and um, they had called the Senate staff to find out so what should we do to keep chronic absence in it? And the Senate staff said, don't do anything. We think there's bipartisan consensus. If you say something, someone might notice it's there, and then they challenge it. So we had the don't do anything lobbying campaign. No one say anything, and it'll probably go unnoticed. It worked. <laughs> um, so. But there's a lot of aspects of ESSA that, you know, it has sets goal, state setting goals. And I would actually say, in red hindsight, I'm really glad that it happened the way it is, did, which is it's a required, required reporting metric. Every state's supposed to include this in their local and state report cards, because I want people to know whether chronic absence is a big problem. Chronic absence, by the way, is not a problem everywhere. It is a problem in some places, disproportionately low-income communities. But we did a research, it's called, I don't know if anyone saw it, called Preventing Missed Opportunity. We used OCR data to look at where chronic absence was concentrated. This was last year's September report. We do a report every September. In that report, we found that 50% of the chronically absent kids in this country are concentrated in 4% of the school districts. It is widespread. Almost all school districts have a couple kids chronically absent. But where the majority are, are highly concentrated. That makes sense? So if we can have reporting, public reporting, then people can know where is this an issue and what does that mean about resource allocation? Because the good news is you don't have to worry about everybody. But I better know about where and which kids I need to worry about. But the other thing about ESSA is it made adoption of chronic absence as an accountability metric optional. And for me, that, was really that is really important. I do not want this to become some other mechanism for compliance, where people collect the data just simply to report it to the federal government. That's not the point of this metric. The point of this metric, it's giving us a tool to change lives and change outcomes for kids. And if we lose sight of that, and this becomes about compliance, we won the battle and lost the war. This has to be about changing outcomes for kids. So the blue states are all the blue states, are all the states that have some form of chronic absence as an accountability metric. And I would say there are even some states, like Mississippi is a standout of not having adopted it. But I know the reason they didn't adopt it is because Carrie Wright, the state superintendent, didn't believe in the quality of the data. She felt to adopt it as a metric now, while they have such challenges with quality, was a mistake, and she wanted to slow down the process. That is a completely acceptable <laughs> decision to me. It doesn't mean she's lost sight of using it, it's just she has to take a slightly different pathway, which is tailored to the realities of her own state. So everyone has to adopt this. Now the other interesting thing, so I was telling you about truancy and how every single place defines it differently. Chronic absence, it's still up to everyone to define it. But what we did was we went out really early with all our state campaign colleagues saying, let's think about what might the defin best definition be. And we recommended adopting missing 10% or more of school because we knew that that could be an early warning metric. The reason I don't like day metrics is if you say kids are missing 18 days, and everyone thinks, oh, at day 17, I better take action so my kid isn't missing 18 days. 
attendance doesn't work that way. It's not like from 17 to 18 you get remarkably different outcomes. We're just trying to kind of, you know, it's, it's a slope. And the question is, where on the slope are we trying to, you know, cut, cut, say that it matters in terms of end of year accountability? The truth is, two days a month, every single month, gets you to be chronically absent. What I want you to notice is the kid who missed 10% the first month of school so that you stop it at two days before you, you know, they keep going. And that's why we wanted the 10%. Um, and the good news is that we might actually get a consistent definition across the country on this one metric, which then would allow us to compare across states, to look for best practice, to look for downward trends, to look for commonalities. That's why we want common metrics, because otherwise it's just kind of hard to do national work. We also, this was Portraits of Change that Eileen mentioned. We used OCR data. So OCR is the only currently national data set available. And we use their data um, to try to look at how concentrated was chronic absence. What we found was that about one out of 10 schools in the country has 30% or more of its kids chronically absent. Another 10, 11% has 20% or more. I think we need to look at what's happening in these schools with the high and extreme levels of chronic absence and think about them differently from the schools that have modest or low levels, right? If you're dealing with a 30 or kids or more versus less than 5% of your kids, your strategy can be really different. You can have a more individual and not maybe have as much of a systems approach when you have a handful of kids. When it's a 30 year student population, you gotta look at the universals because something is affecting a huge portion of the kids in your school. The good news though, is that we actually compared um, kids the, the, by levels of poverty. So if you look at the band at the left, these are all the schools with more than 75% of their kids in poverty, okay? Now look and notice, 19% of their schools have extreme chronically absent, ex absence. 19% of the schools have very low levels of chronic absence. To me, this helps me know, one, this is not inevitable. Yes, kids in poverty have a harder time getting to school. Yes, that means they have serious challenges. But it's also true what schools and communities do together can address those barriers. Because you didn't get 19% of your schools with less than 5% of their kids chronically absent by accident. Someone did something. And we have equal numbers of schools that have done something that haven't been able to grapple with this problem. So we know this is a solvable problem, and we could even use our data on a statewide or local basis to figure it out. And I will say, not everyone, I, the thing, it was like check and connect. Sometimes I find people, they've done something. They didn't even know the term chronic absence. They were just using common sense and other measures, and they were doing things that make sense, because there's a lot about getting kids to school that is not rocket science. Kid misses school, I'll go talk to them, I'll find out what's going on in their lives, I'll solve the problem, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's just that we haven't been doing it as, in as smart of a way as we could, because we haven't been data driven. We talk about, there are, sort of five key ingredients of a systemic approach. And this is what I want to offer as a complement to how you think about Check and Connect. I think Check and Connect is part of this, but this is a framework. We need actionable data so that we know where to take action, and it needs to be accurate. We actually, to be honest, we have shared accountability. The question, so here's my biggest fear. And I would not have chosen the scale. We went from two states with accountability in April, it was my state of California and Connecticut, which we'd been working with for a long time, to 36 states plus DC six months later. That's a level of transformation policy-wise that takes, I never imagined would be possible. My biggest fear is now you're gonna have all this data on poor attendance. My biggest fear is that when you say those, when you see lots of kids not showing up to school, what most people will think is those kids and families just don't care. 
They will blame kids and families for not getting their kids to school. And if we're in an environment where blame is more the norm than less. And I so fear data going out when if the key to attend, improving attendance is positive engagement, it's my ability to not blame a kid, but say, oh, Sandy, I missed you. I noticed you were missing from school. How can I help you? And one of the reasons mentors are so important is the first time I say to Sandy, hey, I noticed you were missing from school, she probably is not going to tell me why she was missing from school. She doesn't trust me enough. Maybe in the 10th time that I call Sandy, you've got to persevere, Sandy will start to open up to me, and I can figure out the issue that I need to help her and her family solve, right? If the key is positive engagement, but the norm is, if my first interaction with Sandy was, Sandy, how come you didn't get to school? Don't you care enough about your education to get here on time? I'm never going to be able to solve the problem because she'll shut down before I even had a shot at figuring out what's going on that might motivate her. Um, Bob Valvance, who's a partner, talks about when kids stop showing up to school, it means you either have to change a behavior or you have to solve a problem, right? Relationships are essential. But negative, punitive action is not the foundation for building a relationship. So that's why we need to have actionable data and shared accountability, but we need to send a message. And that's why we did Attendance Awareness Month. We wanted to get a whole bunch of allies trying to say, send a positive message about why you should show up to school, how we can help you. And then we need to build the capacity of people to be able to use that data. But the key is also strategic partnerships. Because one of the things, it's not just about what people in schools think, it's about what people in communities think. When you have high levels of chronic absence, it means there are community challenges, whether that's foreclosures, lack of transportation, environmental hazards, unsafe paths to school, lack of access to health care. Those don't get solved just by schools alone. And you have to then use that data and convince community partners that we got to partner together. Because honestly, we have safer communities together when we work together. We have more vibrant, positive communities. But that's what part of the data is, needs to be used for. I'm actually going to move through this. So one of the things that we think about is that um, it's helpful to think about the factors that reduce, that, that contribute to chronic absence is falling into these four buckets. One is miss. Families don't recognize that just missing a day here or there can be a problem. It only matters in the older grades. Certainly in people still have long images of kindergarten being this nice, easy socialization to school. Um, probably was when I was a kinder in kindergarten, but it's not what kindergarten today is now. Um, there's these real barriers, issues of aversion. If you see suspension rates going up at the same time as chronic absence rates, you know, when you have poor school discipline, it's not just that the kid misses school when they're suspended. It's that the kid doesn't come back the day they were supposed to come back because they think they were mistreated and no one wants them, right? Or the family's like, and sometimes this even connects to, I talked to one mom whose kid had asthma, and she said, problem is when I was worried, I didn't think the school knew what to do when the kid has asthma, and when I g gave him his meds, he was hyper, and I thought the school would kick him out because he was hyper. So then she would keep him home. Or sometimes when kids don't have a relationship to an adult or a peer, they're not motivated there, or they don't even see how what they're learning in school is relevant to what they're going to do in life. The reason we want people to look at these factors is they're all can be present. And you actually, and it's helped to have that framework. You can use your data at a school level to figure out which one of these things is going on. And you can talk to kids to figure out which things are going on. So if all the kids who have chronic, um, who have asthma 
I have poor, high levels of chronic absence. It could be that there's not, either there's asthma triggers in the school, which I've seen, um, or you don't have a process for doing it, or it's all the kids from one neighborhood and you know the transportation problems are there. You can look at the data or, and honestly I've seen this before, you have chronic absence by classroom. All the classrooms have pretty good attendance and then there's one classroom with really poor attendance. And I've seen different situations. One time I talked to the principal and she said, oh yeah, that's a classroom that has mold in it. I'm like, okay. Um, one time it was the parents said, there's a kid in that classroom, it was a second grade classroom, uncontrolled bullying. The teachers relatively new, has not a clue how to handle, and all the other kids kept calling in sick. In another case, it was a teacher who I was talking to the parent liaison and the parents like, um, yeah, that's the teacher who we all avoid. We pray our kids don't end up in that classroom teacher. And it was clearly someone who I just, you know, sometimes people get burned out. My sister's a teacher. I love teachers dearly. But some teachers, like in every profession, get burned out. And you either need to have a, find a way to help them rejuvenate or counsel them to a different profession because they're not good with the kids anymore. I do think, you know, so you can use your data, though to start looking at where is it concentrated. You can talk to kids, families, and teachers, and you can figure out what's going on. By the way, I do think Check and Connect mentors could have real insights. When you're talking to a bunch of kids, if you can compare notes, you're often getting a clue, because you also have a relationship to have authentic conversations with kids. But I'm not sure there's always a place for that knowledge to go. If there's a play, and I don't know if your app, by the way, over time, might help change that, where you could show patterns across kids who are being seen by Check and Connect mentors. We need to use data to aggregate up, because sometimes it's not always about a case management solution. It's not always about motivating an individual kid more. It's noticing a programmatic barrier that requires a more systematic or policy solution. And when we don't do that, we spend all our resources on individual intervention when what we actually need to do is start to change something that's actually and swim a little upstream that's causing too many kids to fall behind. So we do think about um, investing in early prevention and interven prevention early intervention. And I also want to suggest that when you have really high levels of chronic absence, 30% or more like that, it means you don't have sufficient tier one. You do want to have tier two and tier three, but I want you to avoid the bear, what we see so, so many, too often, high levels of chronic absence, and people think all we need to do is bring in more social workers. That does not compensate for a positive, engaging classroom throughout a school, right? If school is not engaging, if class doesn't feel like a place I want to be, it is really hard to convince young people that they should ought to show up every day. You have to have both. Now, if you have a positive, engaging classroom, and then you have someone who can check in with a kid to find out what are the barriers to getting to school, you may be able to solve issues, right? Or maybe it's a positive, engaging classroom for most kids, but this kid, like for example, um, <laughs> it's really been interesting. I was thinking about your roots with disability and ICI's roots. Um, chronic absence is almost always higher among places with special ed, with high levels of special ed, kids in special ed. I think there's a whole lot of issues. But I've also found class schools where chronic absence is not higher among the kids in special ed. And when I'm in those schools, I know why. They have this inclusive, a lot of times it's like a regio environment where they are just so good about making kids of all different abilities feel welcome and engaged and supported. It actually feels different than a school where the kids in special ed are like foisted off to the side, separated, there's no connection. And you actually see it in the data. But in any case, so sometimes you can find a school where maybe most kids are being showing up, but there's a subpopulation that aren't, and it's because there's a barrier affecting that subpopulation of kids. So, we actually think you need to flip this. <laughs> you got to flip the pyramid. It should be like a funnel. If we're sufficient on tier one, you end up with fewer kids in tier two and fewer kids in tier three. 
and we got to, but what we know is that, um, and so tier one is all kids and families, tier two has moderate absence where you need to have more personalization, tier three is the higher levels. And I do think Check and Connect can be part of both tier two and tier three. I would say, though, that a lot of times tier three kids have more than, um, have more challenging issues. They might be in the child welfare system. They may be dealing with juvenile courts. So Check and Connect by itself is unlikely to be a sufficient um, intervention. Does that make sense? It can be critical for those kids. Like um, Success Mentors, which is not quite Check and Connect, but it has that same personalized outreach. It's a national effort that was started in New York City. They found the kids who were homeless actually responded the most. And I think it's because kids who are homeless feel pretty ostracized from their school environment. Having someone in the school environment who always welcomed them every day made them really feel welcome. But you have to be aware they still are homeless. So, you know, some you need to have coordination with the homeless system to actually address those issues too. So what we actually, I just would also point out in this um, uh, pyramid is we actually try to get people to think about the right hand bar is for whom is that intervention sufficient? So kids who are missing less than 5% chronic absence, you probably don't even need to worry about, they're fine. The kids missing to between five and 9%, the kids at risk, who if you do like positive incentives, by the way, I don't think this is perfect attendance, but it's like every kid, time a kid shows up every day, one week, you know, they, they get recognized, that kind of stuff. Um, those tier one interventions are enough to sometimes keep those kids at missing less than 10% or even moving up into the satisfactory. You will need check and connect and more personalized for the kids who are missing um, uh, 10 to 19%. And then you'd need check and connect, for example, plus some other things for the kids missing 20% or more. Every school, the biggest predictor of chronic absence is prior year chronic absence. So it's a behavior, especially aside from kindergartners, though you could actually get some pre-K data. Um, but um, so you could take data on a school from the prior year and predict how many kids need what level of intervention. This is what I mean, move from truancy is after the fact. I'm going to wait till the kids stop, not show up, and then I'm going to say punitively, you know, if you don't start to show up. This is saying, let's take our data. Let's look at it when we start in the summer and say what level of tier one, tier two, tier three interventions. Tier one actually has to be, remember this is additive, present for everyone, and it's going to be sufficient for the kids who aren't chronically absent. But if I've got 20 kids at tier two, then that's how much tier two I need. You know, this is just an aimed at helping you use data that's very predictive. You might be able to add to this um, behavior and course failure data and make it a little more complex. And I would suggest not doing a separate tiered system for behavior and then another separate one for intervention and then another one for attendance. You will drive yourselves and everyone in your school staff nuts. Um, but I think you can, my problem is that people haven't used attendance data to look at interventions. They've only used behavior and suspensions in academics. And I think we've underutilized attendance as a way to identify enough kids. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to go into too much depth. We know that tier one is those positive learning environments. Um, we know that families will um, often underestimate um, how many days. This is one just funny thing, just so you know about it. And then I know I probably have about three minutes, um, so I will wrap up. Um, they did a survey in California of 800 or so families. This was a Kamala, Kamala Harris, who's now our senator, was one of my strongest allies. And by the way, having attorney generals be your ally is really helpful because people don't think about them as talking about the importance of investing in prevention. And she did. She really talked about a public health model and how being smart on crime was investing in kids' education. Those kind of allies are absolutely invaluable. And what they did was they talked to all these families, all of whom they know their kids had at least missed 10 days the prior year. And when they asked them if they had missed 10 or more days the prior year, only 30% of them said yes. When they asked them, did you miss two days a month last year, 90% of them said yes. Just think about for a moment. It's just families don't see it adding up. Um, I'm, 
we have resources. If you go onto our website, we have a video discussion guide. You can use it with families. Um, you can talk about this work. We have a student attendance success plan that you can get families to track their own chronic absence or track their own attendance. And you also get them to think about who are their supporters. How do we have a network of support each family to get our kids to school? But this allows families to be more proactive. You can both use this in tier one and tier two. Tier one being that you introduce it at the beginning of the year and say this is what we want all our families to do. In tier two, you go and check in where that is. For tier two interventions, that notion of using the 10%, looking at the past year. Um, you could also use the data on the first month of school to start triggering who's starting to be chronically absent. And I would say the kids who had chronic absence in the prior year or who had siblings who were chronically absent, I would make them the highest priority for a personalized intervention. Um, they do know from Baltimore that if you missed a lot the first month of school had predicted on uh, chronic absences throughout the year. There are a whole set of activities. We have resources, again, that can help you think about it, but Check and Connect is one of them. Um, and then in Tier 3, you're going to want to think about how your work integrates with other folks. Um, so this is my last comment here. How many of you guys have a car? Anyone have cars? <laughs> how many of you have ever had a little check engine light? go off on your car. How many of you didn't pay attention to the check engine light and went on a long driving trip to go see your parents for Thanksgiving? And then the car breaks down with your husband and two kids in the back. It's not pretty. <laughs> so I think chronic absence is like that check engine light on your car. If you ignore it, it truly is at your personal peril, right? Because the thing is, you have to, the thing is you can't just ignore it. You actually have to figure, you don't know why it's going off. It could be little. It could be a big deal. Someone has to actually open up the hood and figure out what might be causing it. And if you don't open up the hood and figure that out, I guarantee you it will probably cost you a lot more later to fix. Thank you.